So, um, as Julia mentioned, I would like to talk about this exhibition current, currently on view in uh, uh, TEDCAM Karlsruhe. Um, but, but before that, um, shortly about the title. So, um, I gave the title, there are 24 ways to merge into the word uh, made of images. Uh, it's, um, it's actually a quotation, not, not exactly a quotation, because um, um, Rita Steyer in uh, her uh, How Not To Be Seen, a fucking didactic educational mob file uh, video, uh, which is included in an installation at the uh, ZKM right now, and it's on view. Uh, she mentions uh, different um, counter surveillance techniques. Uh, although these techniques are, um, are kind of, well, they cannot be taken serious, you will see. And, um, uh, and I was thinking that I will concentrate this talk um, on the exhibition, but also on works uh, which are somehow um, um, giving uh, examples of counter surveillance techniques. Well, not only I will I will start with uh, with others other uh, pieces which are um, raising consciousness about the topic, because uh, these were uh, our very um, uh, important criteria. Uh, when we curated the exhibition. So, um, um, yeah, I think then I move on. Yeah, this this is a slide from uh, Hito Steyer's um, video. And this is, uh, this is a poster of the exhibition, Global Control and Censorship, Weltweite Überwachung und Zensur. Um, is the title, it's, uh, the exhibition uh, is global, it's named global because it's a uh, part of the uh, art festival or like uh, uh, art event uh, taking place right now uh, in Karlsruhe, uh, organized by the ZKM called Globale. Um, Globale is, uh, is an aftermath of a long-term research project at the ZKM. And uh, it's, um, it's mainly concentrating on uh, globalization um, in art, very roughly. And um, uh, part of this exhibition is, uh, is control and censorship. Actually, this is the only group show um, in this exhibition series um, which concentrates on a um, current more or less political topic, social and political topic. The other ones are uh, more concentrating on um, 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 usual ZKM stuff, like uh, um, the connections between science and art uh, and so forth. So, um, so this exhibition uh, tries to sum up uh, artistic reactions upon the latest developments of the surve surveillance technologies, infrastructure, and one can say industry, uh, featuring more than uh, 70 artists uh, from all over the world. Um, the main focus of the exhibition was to, uh, to really show very recent artworks, um, about um, mostly uh, online surveillance. We will, we will see also other things which are referring to uh, general control and uh, surveillance. Um, originally, we didn't intend to uh, talk about uh, specifically women under surveillance. So uh, therefore, um, uh, it was not that easy for me to make this selection and uh, I didn't want to follow a, uh, so I didn't want to take the topic very literally, so I did not just choose uh, women artists, but, uh, uh, but you will see. <laughs> and um, uh, to add something to this, so something more to this, uh, most of the works are uh, related to uh, surveillance and are critical to towards the current practice of surveillance. Um, 
They find it controversial that information is being taken from everyone, data traffic is being entirely tapped. Uh, most of uh, the works thematizing surveillance and control are either pointing out a practice, a detail of surveillance infrastructure or control mechanisms, uh, or showing ways and alternatives how to avoid uh, or to fight these. So first I would like to int introduce uh, some works which are um, so-called raising consci consciousness about um, uh, surveillance and control. And the first one of those, uh, the, yeah, before that there is a, a floor plan of the exhibition. As you can see, it's uh, quite complex and uh, we have also some drawings in the air. Uh, the, this is the how to read uh, artist list. And um, uh, as you can see, the, the KHM is uh, strongly represented. And um, so maybe, <laughs> maybe it's the right time to say thank you for uh, Julia Scher and uh, Christian Sievers to, um, uh, with helping us during the organization of uh, the exhibition and uh, um, that, that they also cooperated with us and uh, uh, helped us um, to gather opinions and artworks from students as well and to exhibit it in Salzburg. So, um, yeah, I, I put it in German actually, but uh, I, I think most of you get it. Um, it's, uh, yeah. Um, this is from uh, Yung He Chang, uh, Heavy Industries, an artist couple from South Korea uh, who were formed in uh, 1999. And uh, this artist duo expresses their philosophy on art and the word through their animated text pieces without holding back on scandal statements and ideas. Uh, they're quite controversial controversial piece, uh, Kunilingus in North Korea, uh, features statements uh, in the style of uh, Kim Jong-il, uh, former leader of North Korea. Uh, the text explains the importance of dialectical sex in the style of uh, communist propaganda speeches and uh, juxtaposes capitalist and communist morals towards sexuality. Um, it's a, it's a video installation. And uh, we, we chose this, although it's not uh, directly related to uh, surveillance, this, uh, this topic is uh, related to control. And, um, um, and uh, this is a very um, subtle way to uh, approach uh, this topic, I would say. And uh, um, and to uh, talk about um, the formulation or the rhetorics of uh, uh, oppression. This is an installation view from the exhibition. And the next piece I, I would like to show is, uh, is also a video work from Holly Herndon and Matta Haven. It's, uh, you might be familiar with this piece. It, uh, it's quite uh, well known right now. Uh, it's called Home. And um, th this is actually a simple pop song from uh, Holly Her Herndon. And uh, in the text, uh, she, she reveals uh, her intimate relationship with her laptop. So it's uh, in a style of a pop song, uh, sorry. Uh, love song and uh, she says or she states that um, after the revelations about the NSA in 2013 her um, her relationship with her computer changed fun fundamentally because uh, it was previously based on trust but uh, these revelations uh, changed it and she suggests uh, suggests in the video that uh, the computer knows her better than she knows herself um, because she's constantly being surveyed uh, through the computer. 
Um, for the video, um, the visual counterpart uh, to Herndon's music is created by Meta Haven. Um, as you can see, like uh, if it's moving, it's a data rain uh, of code names, acronyms, icons, and graphics from a shadow word designed uh, never to be publicly exposed. Uh, they, they are not the only artists who are working uh, with this um, uh, with these visual elements of um, uh, organizations such as the NSA. So like, uh, for example, in Venice, there was a, a very great show of Simon Denny about that. Um, the next one is the actually the earliest work uh, in our exhibition from, from 2004. It's trust. It's a. Uh, it's again a video of uh, an American artist, uh, Jill Maygit. I, I hope. And um, um, it's um, it's a CCTV. Uh, so it's an edited uh, CCTV footage. Um, and uh, it's part of her her quite long term project, Evidence Locker. Um, she uh, she made it in collaboration with uh, Liverpool's uh, City Watch, um, and at that time, uh, Great Britain's largest citywide video uh, surveillance. So it was the largest video surveillance system in uh, Liverpool, and uh, she was navigating in the city with a red uh, trench coat, and uh, she periodically contacted um, a police officer who was uh, sitting in front of the surveillance monitors um, to, uh, to train their public cameras on her. So uh, that's how she made this, uh, these footages. She's, she's always uh, in, uh, in the image and um, um, and somehow she, uh, sometimes she's also giving instructions uh, to the police officer um, what to do. And also uh, she's, um, in cases she's blindfolded and uh, she's moving uh, as the police officer tells her uh, where to move. Uh, so it's, um, it's a reversed uh, practice uh, through uh, surveillance apparatus. And uh, I also wanted to show you, maybe some of you haven't seen it yet, uh, Julia Cher's uh, work, the Girl Dogs House of Cher. It's, um, it consists of marble statues and a four channel sound installation. Uh, these are f uh, two of the eight marble dogs uh, in Karlsruhe at the exhibition. You see a bit more, but it's uh, not, not so easy uh, to make a photograph of it uh, due to the strange, strange uh, spatial conditions uh, at ZKM. Um, anyways, um, so this work engages critically with surveillance, uh, specifically surveillance architecture in a way, uh, in my opinion. Um, and uh, these marble sculptures uh, of dogs uh, and, uh, and the soundtracks, soundtrack, uh, which explains um, that uh, these possibly formidable dogs are actually very friendly creatures and they are meant to guard the visitors. Uh, this makes the metaphors for the close relationship uh, between the fans or control and fear. And um, they are uh, situated around um, a work called uh, Confessionarium, is a, a transparent um, confession uh, box. I, I'm sorry, but I forgot the correct English name of it, Beistuhl. And um, um, so, in this sense, these two works in the exhibition uh, also uh, relate to each other. And uh, 
one can say that the the car the dogs guard uh, transparency as well uh, as a very important uh, principle um, so to say to fight towards uh, control and surveillance so i would um, go on and um, introduce some works um, which are uh, kind of um, counter surveillance uh, and counter control strategies or uh, offering uh, such strat strategies. And um, uh, one of these is Travel Paglens and uh, Jacob Applebaum's Autonomy Cube. This work um, is uh, designed for museums and public places. It's a platform um, in, a, in form of a sculpture, like a minimalist sculpture. Uh, one could think of uh, Hans Hacker's uh, condensation cube uh, from the 60s as a um, visual parallel. And, um, but uh, this cube, um, well, it's, uh, you can badly see, but uh, it's a very, very thick uh, acrylic cube which houses uh, a server, an internet server, and everyone who is uh, close to it uh, can uh, use a network. It seems to be a very uh, normal internet uh, VLAN, so Wi-Fi network. And, um, but it turns out that it isn't. It's, um, uh, it's run through uh, Tor servers, so, um, uh, if you are using it, uh, you will not, you are not trackable. So uh, that's that's the idea of the Tor network, uh, which is co-founded by uh, Jacob Applebaum. That the user uh, cannot be tracked back, um, and of course, uh, it's a, it's a very very controversial phenomenon because um, uh, some. Um, People misuse it, uh, obviously, and uh, there were, for example, this uh, drug trading website, the Silk Road, which was shut down last year. Um, they also used Tor network, and that's that's how it uh, took a long time to uh, to catch them and to shut the website down. And um, but but actually the. The artists and activists, so uh, Applebaum and Paglen, uh, they uh, uh, they try to show the positive side of this, that uh, this is preventing the visitors to um, um, to be tracked, to to be surveilled and followed through uh, through their ways on the internet. Although um, just a couple of days ago, a visitor wrote us a, a message that uh, we should make it clear uh, in the description of the work that um, actually if you are using Tor network, then uh, uh, you might be uh, surveyed um, stronger from, uh, from any intelligence service um, than, than before. And uh, yeah, actually we should do that. The next one. The next piece is uh, unfortunately not in the exhibition, but uh, I really attempted for a long time to um, uh, to make it part of the exhibition. But the communication with the artist was uh, was not so easy. That's that's the only reason why uh, it's not there, unfortunately. So it is uh, Adam Harvey's uh, stealthware, and uh, this this is one one piece of the collection. It's an ant anti-drone burka um, uh, and uh, the collection uh, consists of I think five or six uh, similar um, garments uh, which, um, which are designed to uh, say uh, yeah actually to save uh, its um, uh, the persons who are wearing them um, from drone attacks. Uh, this material, what he uses, uh, is a reflective material, um, and uh, that's that's how drones uh, cannot detect if there's a person there or it's 
on the on the end object okay and um, it's uh, it's actually uh, quite controversial that an anti-drone burqa uh, counter surveillance uh, um, tool uh, is uh, is a burqa an out an outer garment uh, which is worn uh, in some Islamic um, communities um, to cover with women bodies when they are in public. And uh, of course, this this piece of garment is um, uh, is a symbol of uh, oppression for uh, for quite a long time. The next piece, um, I was I was going to show also some. If we have time for that, and I think we have, um, so to show some moving image because um, it's also a, a project. Um, which is not only a video, but uh, also an installation, and there are some masks uh, uh, connected to it, or made by the artist, Zach Blas, uh, facial weaponization su suit. Uh, this, um, this piece offers a strategy against uh, facial recognition, and... Um, and it protests against uh, biometric facial recognition um, and, the uh, and the inequalities these uh, technologies propagate. And uh, he's making collective masks um, in community-based workshops um, that are modeled from the aggregated facial data of participants, resulting in amorphous masks that cannot be detected as human faces by biometrical facial, facial recognition technologies. So uh, this is an installation view. It's, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't show the whole uh, installation altogether. These are uh, two shots, like uh, one, uh, one are the masks and, uh, and the other are photos of them. And uh, so then I would like to show a part of the facial weaponization community, which is about uh, one of the four masks is uh, the fact face. I, well, let's see it maybe from the beginning. Today, in our world of information capital and global empire, biometric control has emerged as a golden frontier for neoliberal governments, a multi-billion dollar industry in security and marketing sectors. Biometric companies produce devices like iris scans and facial recognition machines with the hopes of manufacturing the perfect automated identification tools that can successfully read a core identity off the body. Biometric devices are becoming powerful weapons to control and police national borders and citizenship status track and target the nation or company's enemies and criminals as well as to profile and parse various sectors of the public into potential risk categories, like activists. Biometrics also determine marketing strategies through standardized algorithmic processing of identification markers such as gender and race. Biometric technologies rely heavily on stable and normative conceptions of identity, and thus, Structural failures are encoded in biometrics that discriminate against race, class, gender, sex, and disability. For example, fingerprint devices often fail to scan the hands of Asian women and iris scans work poorly if an eye has cataracts. Biometric failure exposes the inequalities that emerge when normative categories are forced upon populations. Facial recognition technology has become a pervasive, popular device for biometric surveillance, a thriving, rapidly developing part of our new surveillance culture. Facial recognition techniques now range from algorithms that extract landmarks on faces, such as cheekbones, noses, eyes, and jaws, 
to 3D programs that map the shape of a face to various forms of skin texture analysis. Typically, faces are collected in databases to compare and search against for a variety of possible criminal activities. For example, in its 2000 presidential election, the Mexican government used facial recognition to prevent voter fraud. In 2001, Tampa Bay police used identity facial recognition software to search for criminals and terrorists during the Super Bowl, finding 19 people with pending arrest warrants. Within the last year, occupied activists and Afghan civilians have been the target of massive biometric data gathering sweeps by U.S. police and military forces. The ubiquity of facial recognition now spans from London's massive CCTV network to the German Federal Criminal Police Office. Facebook's facial recognition auto photo tagging, Apple's iPhoto and iPhone, Google's PlayCasa, U.S. Homeland Security, and the U.S. Department of State, which has the largest facial recognition system in the world, add over 75 million photographs for visa processing. We also commonly experience facial recognition and detection now with our digital cameras that locate faces, and even smiles. Facial recognition has even ventured into the terrain of sexual orientation. The Journal of Experimental Social Psychology recently published a 2008 study conducted at Tufts University that tested people's ability to identify homosexual men from photos of their faces. 90 faces were shown to 90 participants against a white background. The faces were stripped of all markings and accessories, such as piercings and eyeglasses. Even hair was cropped leaving participants with only the face. Those tested proved remarkably accurate in their ability to recognize faces that had been classified as homosexual, even when exposed to the face for only 50 milliseconds, which is not possible to process consciously. Even when a section of the face was shown, such as an eye or lips, participants still correctly identified the homosexual faces. A similar study recently emerged at the University of Washington in 2012. So, um, we are running out of time, so I, uh, and I would like to show another detail of another video. So I just stopped it, but um, maybe we can return to it later. And um, so I, I found it uh, very interesting. Um, uh, so in, in these studies and uh, that um, facial recognition works uh, so efficiently uh, as it does. And uh, of course, um, Zach Blas is, uh, is offering a strategy against this facial recognition. Um, with these masks, uh, what what he created, uh, of course, these are not for daily wear. It's uh, they look very nice in the museum, but uh, it's uh, um, it's not really an everyday. Um, not they are not really for everyday use. Uh, the same same principle, uh, or even uh, a step further. Uh, happens with uh, Hito Steyer's How Not to Be Seen a Fucking Didactic Educational Moth File. Uh, as I've mentioned before, there are uh, many suggestions uh, in it. Um, how, to, um, how to hide, how to um, merge uh, into uh, images, so how to get, uh, get lost um, uh, in this uh, ubiquitousness of, uh, of imagery. Uh, these are details of the installation and uh, uh, it's not really understandable till, till you see the video. These are al also part of the installation and this is, uh, this is part of the video. Um, so maybe, oh sorry, um, maybe first um, we go to the video again and then I would a little bit more. file lesson one 
There are four ways to make something invisible for a camera. To hide. To remove. To go off screen. To disappear. This is a resolution target. It measures the visibility of a picture. This is a resolution target. It measures the resolution of the world as a picture. Resolution determines visibility. Whatever is not captured by resolution is invisible. How not to be seen? Lesson 2 There are seven ways of making something invisible in plain sight. Pretend you are not there. Hide in plain sight. To scroll. To wide. To erase, to shrink, to take a picture. So we are really running out of time so uh, I would stop this as mentioned uh, there are all together 54 um, ways uh, to hide uh, and uh, uh, from surveillance and uh, these were just some, some of them uh, Hito Staya is concentrating um, not uh, exactly uh, on uh, uh, women under surveillance or the gendered perspective on surveillance uh, but uh, um, but uh, her main topic is the ontology of the image and um, but uh, but on the other hand and uh, that's why it uh, gave the title to my talk um, she uh, mentions uh, one one of the 54 ways of um, um, of hiding uh, as uh, being a female um, above the age of 50 so um, it's um, uh, uh, it's it also tells a lot because uh, she uh, she thinks that um, uh, this is already a way of uh, social invisibility to uh, to be a female over fifty. And um, actually, this was the the last work I wanted to introduce from the, from the exhibition. And uh, you you might ask, or I'm I asked myself uh, why. Uh, or how is it related um, to uh, women, and uh, why is it uh, why surveillance is uh, specific, um, so or can be specific uh, to this topic, and um, and by uh, uh, searching for an answer, I uh, I came across a very classic solution, so to say, and. Um, And this uh, classic solution is a, is a Donna Haraway uh, quotation. 
because uh, she states uh, in her book Simeon Cyborgs uh, and Women, the Re Reinvention of Nature from 91, that um, odd bounder creatures, simian cyborgs and women, which have uh, had destabilizing place uh, in the great Western evolutionary, technological and uh, biological narratives. Um, I would um, I would add that uh, um, there are more old boundary creatures than simian cyborgs and women. Um, may, maybe the fourth uh, group of these um, boundary creatures are uh, the ones who are developing counter surveillance strategies, uh, regardless of their gender, uh, because. Uh, they have sort of a destabilizing uh, place in the great Western evolutionary, technological, and biological narrative. Um, and uh, to go one step further, these boundary creatures are literally monsters, a word that uh, shares more than its root uh, with the word to demonstrate. demonstrate. Monsters signify. Well. Thank you.